Good morning. Welcome to God's house. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. I want to start with a question. How many of you have ever thought something was unfair and then complained about it? <laughs> you all should be nodding right now, right? We're experts at that, aren't we? Well, today our, our Lord reminds us that he has given to us an incredible gift, something that, that means that we have no reason to ever complain. We have no reason to ever take it to Facebook because of some injustice in our lives or in this world. He has given to us the power of prayer to be able to converse with the Almighty God. That's what we're going to be focusing on today in our lessons as well as in the hymns. Let's begin today with the opening hymn. And today will, it's another special day because we're going to be having a baptism. So we're going to be opening with a baptism hymn, hymn 297. Hymn 297. May God richly bless your worship today. Please stand. We'll follow the order of holy baptism. Uh, you can look on the screen or on your hymnals, page 12 with the front part of your hymnal. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Our Savior Jesus Christ commanded baptism when he said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All of us are born into this world with a deep need for baptism. From our parents, we inherit a sinful nature. We are without true fear of God and true faith in God and are condemned to eternal death. But Jesus took away our sin by giving his life on the cross. At our baptism, he clothes us with the robe of his righteousness and gives us a new life. Our sinful nature need not control us any longer. We recall what baptism means for our daily lives as we speak these words. Baptism means that the sinful nature in us should be drowned by daily sorrow and repentance and that all its evil deeds and desires be put to death. It also means that a new person should daily arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. As baptized children of God, we confess our sins. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful 
and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. In obedience to the command of our Lord and trusting in his promise, you have brought this child to be baptized. Jesus told us, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. It is in baptism that God grants the new life of forgiveness, joy, and peace to little children. By the power of God's word, this gracious water of life washes away sin, delivers from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe. Receive the sign of the cross on the head and on the heart to mark you as redeemed child of Christ. Madeline Grace Kriaski, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has forgiven all your sins. By your baptism, you were born again and made a dear child of your Father in heaven. May God strengthen you to live in your baptismal grace all the days of your life. Peace be with you. Please stand. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord commands that we teach his precious truths to all who are baptized. Christian love therefore urges all of us, especially parents and sponsors, to assist in whatever manner possible so that Madeline may remain a child of God until death. If you are willing to carry out this responsibility, then answer yes, as God gives me strength. Yes, as God gives me strength. Let us pray. Merciful Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessing of baptism by which you offer and grant the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Help us to regard our baptism as the robe of righteousness we are to wear all the days of our life. Look a special favor on Madeline and grant her a rich measure of your spirit that she may grow in faith and godly living. Make us willing to carry out our responsibilities to those who have been baptized so that all of us may finally come to the blessed joys of heaven. Through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> well, I'll continue by singing the hymn of praise, and you'll see that in your insert. I will be singing uh, in peace and joy. The solos will sing the first verse, and we'll join in by singing the second and third verse. <laughs>
Christ Jesus brought this gift to me, my faithful Savior, whom you allowed my eyes to see by your Your ears are always open to the prayers of your humble servants who come to you in Jesus' name. Teach us always to ask according to your will that we may never fail to obtain the blessings you have promised through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our lessons for today are going to be focusing around the gift of prayer that God has given to us. Our first lesson that comes from Genesis chapter 18, we see Abraham praying to the Lord to be just and fair, to save the righteous who live among the wicked. This will also be the focus of our sermon today. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five people? If I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again, he spoke to him, What if only 40 are found there? He said, For the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, Now that I have been so bold to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? He said, For the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only ten can be found there? He answered, for the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. This is the word of our Lord. Continue by singing together the psalm of the day, Psalm 6, which is found on page 66 in the front part of your hymnal.
Our second lesson for today comes from the book of James, chapter 5. And here in this lesson, we're reminded that we are not only declared righteous, but we have also, because of that status, been given an incredible gift, prayer. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the person, the sick person, well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain in the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. This is the word of our Lord. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. Please stand out of respect for the words and works of Jesus. Our gospel for today comes from Luke chapter 11. In this lesson, Jesus himself teaches us about prayer and gives us the perfect model for prayer. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is the Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. We now invite the children to come forward for the children's message. Is all fine to see? Good. All right. I have a question for you today. How many of you pray? How many of you pray? Yeah? Good. Good. Well, um, we just talked about a few lessons that talk about prayer. Jesus just mentioned how he taught us the Lord's Prayer. Do you guys know the Lord's Prayer? You guys know that one? Yeah, we're going to be saying that later on in the service too. Our Father who art in heaven. But at home, I know sometimes when I pray with, with my little girls, they, and I ask them what to pray for, they don't always know what to pray for, all right? And so I want to help you today think about what to pray for at home, and we're going to do something called 
the five-fingered prayer. Okay, I want all of you guys to fold your hands for a second. Can you do that? Fold your hands. And which finger, as you fold your hands, which fingers are closest to you? Which ones? The thumbs, right? Yeah, the thumbs. Those are the closest ones to you. So the, for the, as we go through the different fingers on our hand, the one that's closest to us reminds us to pray for those who are closest to us in our family, like our parents, like our brothers and sisters, like our grandparents, all right? The next one, what's the next finger you have on your hand? After the thumb comes the index finger, the pointer finger. This is the one that you use to point with. This is what people use who give direction. So we want to pray for people who give direction, like your teachers, your pastors. Pray for those people. Pray for your, your parents' bosses, right? Pray for them. The next finger on your hand is the tallest one. It's the tallest finger. And so we have to think about those people who are leaders in our communities and in our country. Who should we pray for in our country? Who's the biggest leader in our country? God is. You got it. <laughs> that was a good answer. Yeah. And, and after God, we have President Barack Obama. So pray for the president. Pray for our governor. Pray for our mayor. Pray for our police, policemen. After the tallest finger, we have this one right here. This is your ring finger. This is also, and if you play piano, you know, this is the weakest finger that you have on your hand. Okay? So we want to pray for those people who are weak and sick. All right, pray for them. And then the last one, after praying through all of your other fingers, you get to the last one, and the last one reminds you to pray for yourself, okay? So what I want to do with you right now is I want you to fold your hands again, and we're going to pray through the five-fingered prayer, all right? Dear Jesus, we praise and thank you for giving to us family and friends. We know that uh, we just ask you to be with our, our parents and with our brothers and sisters and always protect them. And Lord, also we want to pray for those people who give us direction in life, like our pastors and our teachers and our, our parents' bosses. Be with them too and always remind them of the peace that they have in Jesus. We also, Lord, want to pray for those people who are in authority in our nation. Pray for Barack Obama and our governor and, and the mayor who are in this country and in our city. Just give them wisdom and give them strength to keep peace in the land. And Lord, we also want to pray for those people who are weak and who are sick. Uh, give them strength. You who are all-powerful can do that. So please help those people. And finally, Lord, we ask you to pray. Well, we, we pray for, for ourselves. Each of us here has a different problem, a different need. And so we just ask you to be with us and help us. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Here, I have one more thing before you go. All right. Um, I have, I'm going to give one of this to each of you. And this is your homework. You have to teach your parents this. Can you guys do that tonight? Go home and you have to teach your parents the five-fingered prayer. Is that all right? So before you leave, grab one of these things and you can teach your parents this later on today. You want to grab one? There you go. There you go. And after you grab your piece of paper, you can go back to your seat. All right? Thanks for coming up. There you go. You're welcome. There you go. Might run out of pieces of paper. That's all right. You guys can go back. I got it. <laughs> You guys have this at home. <laughs> there you go. There you go, Cole. Just enough. Look at that. Perfect. Oh no, I missed one. Do you guys want to share? You want one to her? Here, you want to give one to her then? You share? Oh, that's nice of you. There you go. All right. Whew. So I think we got it. I'll make more copies next time. <laughs> we'll continue by singing the next hymn.
our sermon today, we're going to be focusing on the Old Testament lesson, which came from Genesis chapter 18. If you want to open up the Bibles in your pews to that, I'll be going through those different verses uh, throughout the sermon today. Situations seem to grab our attention when they aren't fair. The media picks up on this, and that's why on the news you see things about terrorist plots around the world. You'll see things about police brutality or police assassinations, and all of us are, are glued to our television screens. Things are blowing up on Facebook, on social media. Everybody has a comment. Because we are people who demand justice, and we hate injustice. We want things to be fair, even if it's not in our own life. We want things to be fair. And so what do you do when you want something to be fair, when you see an injustice? Maybe you'll post something on Facebook. Maybe you'll share some type of an article that shows the views which you feel to be just. Maybe you'll simply complain to one of your friends. Right? And what does that do to help the situation, typically? Nothing. Right? But today, our God reminds us of an incredible gift that makes your voice louder than any type of social media and that puts you in contact with the king of the universe, the person who can actually make changes in this world. He gives to you and me the gift of prayer. Now the lesson that we are looking at today, again, comes from Genesis chapter 18. You actually looked at this chapter last week in your sermon, but you looked at the first part of the chapter. And we saw there how God came down to visit with Abraham and to tell Abraham and Sarah that even in their old age they were going to have a child. But he had something else that he wanted to tell Abraham too. He talks to him about the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah. And this is what he says in verse 20, the opening uh, verses of our lesson. The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. Now what is this outcry? Was it the plea from some random travelers who happened to be passing through Sodom and Gomorrah and said a prayer to the Lord? Was it maybe an earlier prayer from Abraham? Was it simply the stench of sin that raised up from heaven because of the cesspool of immorality? Whatever it was, it was so bad that the Lord decided that he was going to literally go down and see what was going on. And seeing this lesson might cause us to think that what was going on there in Sodom and Gomorrah is so much worse than what's happening in our cities around our world today. But I don't think that's the case at all. King Solomon says, there's nothing new under the sun. The same horrific sins that have been going on from the beginning of time continue to go on in our cities around the world and in our nation today. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not surprised by anything that I see on the news anymore. I think we know that we have seen by experience that what we know in the Bible is true, that by our sinful nature, we are able, as human beings, as sinful human beings, we are capable of anything at any time, no matter how horrible it is. And if that's true, then how many times has the Lord come down to this world to this country, to this city, to our own home because of the stench that was reminiscent of Sodom. Because realize that Sodom was a big city. The, only, the sins that were going on there were not just sexual sins. There were many sins going on in that city. And when he comes down, what does he see? Does he see people who are loving each other, people with unrelenting patience, people who are completely selfless and working to help everyone else? Or does he see something very different? When he comes down to our city, to our country, to our homes. There are many of you who can probably think of moments in your life, in your own home, in the privacy of your home, when if one of your good friends were there to see what happened, you would be so ashamed. And they would say of you, wow, I didn't expect that of them. And so what do we deserve? What would be fair? What would be just? 
How many times has the Lord been in a throwing motion with fire and brimstone when he looked at this world or this country or this city or even our own households? But a better question is, what stopped him? Why has God not treated La Crosse County like he treated Sodom and Gomorrah? See, God is a holy and just God. And holiness is one of those absolutes that we would call an absolute attribute. You can't be a little bit holy or a lot holy. You either are holy or you're a sinner. And we are sinners. And so it bothers me in this lesson when I see Abraham going to God and saying, Hey, Lord, treat us fairly. Be just to us. This is his, his request to the Lord. He says, Will not the judge of all the earth do right? And I want to say to Abraham, slap him upside the head and say, What are you doing? If the Lord treats us justly and fairly, we're all doomed. Don't you want to save your nephew Lot and his family in Sodom? Why would you ask the Lord to be just at this time? But there's something else that's found in this prayer that helps us understand what he is asking of God. Listen to the whole prayer. This, this lesson, or this prayer that we have right here is the very first recorded prayer in Scripture. And Abraham prays for something very specific, God's justice. He says this in verse 23, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of 50, with, for the sake of 50 people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right. Now look at that last phrase specifically. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Will not the judge do justice? Abraham is asking the Lord to not treat those who are considered righteous and those who are considered wicked in the same way. So the question obviously is, what is the definition of someone who is righteous and what's the definition of someone who is wicked? We obviously know that there was much immorality going on in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. But I have no doubt that it was a large city, that there may have been plenty of people who were protesting that immorality, who wanted to hold themselves up and, and protesting for, for family values, who maybe would be considered in our standards good and decent people. But being a good and decent person, trying to be a good and decent person, does not make us righteous. Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 does not say, try to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. In Matthew 5, Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. There's a difference. The only way that we can be called righteous and holy is through our Savior Jesus. See, there are two specific attributes of God which caused us to be righteous. On the one hand, his holiness and his justice, and on the other hand, his compassion and his love. And the two seem to be at odds with each other, don't they? How can you have both coexisting in the same person? But you see, in our, in our court system today, when we look at a judge, you, you would not want a judge who is on the extreme side of compassion and love because, well, then they, wouldn't, they would be letting people go who are guilty. They wouldn't want to punish them. In the same way, you wouldn't want a judge who is on the extreme side of, of justice, who sticks to the letter of the law with absolutely no compassion. We want a balance of both. That's not who God the judge is. He is extreme holiness and justice, and he is extreme compassion and love. And how can those two coexist with each other? The answer is only found in Christ. It's resolved in Christ. 2,000 years ago, for the very first time, this world was able to not just hear about God's love and compassion, but we could see it when Jesus was born. And that extreme compassion of God giving up his son for this world is played out through his entire life as he lives a perfect life in our place. He goes through the same temptations and difficulties while, while putting away his divinity for you and me. 
but his compassion, his extreme compassion and love hits its climax when he goes to the cross willingly. And that extreme compassion and love collide with extreme justice from God as God punishes Jesus on the cross without mercy and without compassion for each and every one of your sins so that you and I today could be called righteous and holy. One seeming act, one unjust act, God punishing his innocent son for us, and we are considered righteous. It's amazing. It's the same in our court system today. After a trial, it doesn't matter if you really are guilty or not guilty. What matters is what the judge declares you to be. And you and I have been declared innocent, righteous of Christ. And that is what Abraham is pleading to the Lord to remember. That those who believe and trust in the Savior who would come are considered righteous through Christ, Lot and his family, and for any other who believe. We pray that God would treat us in that same way. We plead with the Lord that God would treat us with that same justice, that God would remember that we are his own children. Remember that we ask the Lord that God would not throw us in with the weeds with whom we live in this world, but would hold back his fire and brimstone for you and me. See, I asked you that question before. What is the reason why the Lord has not sent fire and brimstone down in La Crosse County? What's holding him back? And the answer is you. You who have been considered righteous through Christ. Prayer really is a remarkable gift. It's, it's one of the benefits that we have because we have been considered righteous. And being righteous means that we are a close personal friend of the most powerful being in the universe, our God. See, what happened here, and I didn't get to read in our lesson for today, but just a few verses before our lesson, as God was transitioning between talking to Abraham about the child that he was going to have to talking about Sodom, this is the conversation that God, God has. He says this. He says, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Isn't that a remarkable thought? That before the Lord went and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, he wanted to talk about this. And hear Abraham's reaction. He treats Abraham like a close personal friend. All because he's considered righteous. You are a close personal friend of the Lord too. And for those of you who maybe may feel that the Lord is far from you because of something that you did in the past, for those of you who think that the Lord doesn't want to hear your prayers and doesn't listen to your prayers, you could not be further from the truth. He is your close personal friend. And just as the Lord shared his plan with Sodom and Gomorrah, he also shares with you and me his entire plan of salvation in the Bible. And he wants that conversation to continue through prayer. Now, there's no formula or trick to prayer, just as there's no formula or trick to talking to one of your friends. And yet in this lesson, we... We can pick up some things, some examples for our own prayer life. And I think the first thing that we can learn from Abraham's prayer here is his persistence and boldness in prayer. It's to the point where I'm, I personally am a little bit bothered by how much Abraham kept asking the Lord back and forth. This is what he says. He, he starts off by asking the Lord, what about 50? What if there are 50 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah? You wouldn't destroy them for that. And you know that Abraham was probably counting on his hand, thinking, okay, there's Lot, his family. All right, maybe I should go down to 45. Or what about 45? What about 40? What about 30? What about 20? What about 10? And it keeps going down and down, and I'm kind of bothered by that. Stop bothering the Lord. But the Lord's not bothered, is he? He encourages your persistence and your boldness for whatever prayer. Knowing that the Lord has the power to remove your cancer like that. Get rid of any 
reserve crops in the future. To give you the financial peace, the emotional peace that right now you think is impossible. Pray boldly, pray persistently. He also teaches us here to pray with humility. You see, Abraham is praying to a close friend, but we also see the amount of respect that he has when he speaks to the Lord. There's a few phrases that he uses throughout this prayer. He says, there are nothing but dust and ashes, and may the Lord not be angry. See, while we pray boldly to our friend, we also recognize that we are walking into the throne room of the King of the Universe. And we do not demand that our will be done, but we ask that His will be done. He listens to God. He changes things. Who knows what would have happened to Lot and his family without that prayer? So today, as people who have been considered righteous and holy, I ask you to pray to the Lord for Him to be just, to treat you as who you are to Christ. He prays that.
also pray for uh, Ronald Wintron and Carrie Marks, who were married yesterday. Keep them in our prayers. Lord God, we thank you for making us righteous through your Son's work, your compassion and justice. We're perfectly resolved in him, and because of that, we are considered to be your children forever.
Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Please be seated for the closing hymn. Pleasure again being here with, with all of you. First of all, congratulations to Madeline and Travis and family. Happy Tuesday. I'm sure to greet you as we leave. 
Um, a few announcements too. Uh, the last call meeting we called Gail Bolstaff to be our sixth grade teacher. She's accepted the call to answer to a lot of parents. Um, also, day camp is going to be starting tomorrow, uh, which means if you haven't signed up yet, still want to sign up yet, or still want to invite one of your neighbor kids to that, they're, they're still welcome to. Uh, they can either sign up online or just show up tomorrow morning. We'd love to have them. Um, in conjunction with day camp going on this whole week, we are going to be moving the Thursday night service a half hour earlier to 6.30 p.m. Okay, so in case the, the kids are going to be singing during that service, so just keep that in mind. Thursday night service, just this week, is 6.30 p.m. Right. Take some time now just to look around, greet those people who are around you, especially those people that you don't know, don't know their names, get to know them. God blesses on your week, everyone.